uh, asked to do a little bit of pres presentation here on resistance training for youth, uh, for all the great uh, physical education teachers we have out there. So yeah, spent a lot of time in Nova Scotia, grew up there. That's where I went to university. For those of you who are wondering, I did go to St. of X. So anybody in the, went to St. of X, you can give a X up in the chat there so we can see it later on. Um, Calgary and then back over in the Maritimes and PEI right now. And that's where I'm, uh, I'm working at currently. But let's jump right into some resistance training for youth. Um, today, we're going to talk about some misconceptions, go over the benefits, some guidelines, going to give everybody some tips and tricks as well as some sample workouts. Um, the sample workouts, when I get to them, they will be in uh, a PDF form and they'll go out with that email that's going to go out after this uh, this lecture. So I'll make sure Faye gets those and they're sent out with that email. And in the sample workouts, I'm going to have hyperlinks to all of the exercises that I cover. So you'll have some video um, representation of, of the exercise uh, so you can uh, get an idea of what it's all about. Okay, so uh, let's going to do poll question one. I think Faye is going to launch our first poll question here um so i can kind of get an idea of what everybody's into hey you got that there we go so our first polling question is are you currently doing any weight training with your students so please select the appropriate response and click submit Okay, 70% of you have responded and uh, we'll give it another 30 seconds. So if the pool is not working for you, you can also type your response um, in the question pane. We can see your response that way. But it seems that the pool is working for uh, most of the attendees. Okay, so we're now closing the pool and let me share the result. It looks like the majority of you responded to yes, some selected no, and uh, the rest of you responded as not yet, but considering. And now I'll hand it back over to Rob. Awesome, great, uh, thanks Faye. So it looks like uh, a large majority of you are doing uh, some resistance training with your students um, right now, or when we're not in our uh, quarantine, when we're kind of back in, back in class. Uh, some not, uh, some uh, considering, which is which is great. So, big question is, should youth engage in resistance training? And this is still a hot topic that's out there. Some people are still against resistance training for youth. Uh, there's still a lot of those common misconceptions out there. People still say, will it um, stunt their growth? Um, and there's been no no real scientific evidence that's showing that it's something anybody's growth. The original literature that came out was some scientific studies conducted in the mid 1800s with coal mining children. And it just said that the children that are working in the mines were of shorter stature. So they assumed that they were doing some heavy labor and that that was stunting their growth. That's a complete misconception. That's not how real science is done. There's been no evidence that's showing it's gonna stunt their growth. Um, resistance training is uh, dangerous and it's going to cause injury. And again, there's no real instances of it's causing any more injury than any other type of sport that's out there. If you look at, you know, soccer, hockey, football, rugby, you know, all of them have inherent dangers in them. Uh, as pe if people are being coached well in resistance training, then it actually lessens the um, injury that people will get in other sports. So. There isn't a lot of um, issues with it being dangerous, as long as people are doing it appropriately and they're being coached well um, and uh, all the safety precautions are being taken place when they're doing uh, resistance training. And for some reason, I still get this every once in a while, resistance training uh, can decrease athletic performance. I'm not even sure where that comes from. 
uh, it, it makes athletes slow, which is ex the exact opposite. Uh, nobody can really argue with uh, all of the athletes nowadays are doing some sort of resistance training. Take any sport on the planet and they're doing some sort of athletic type of uh, resistance training. You know, even I was watching the last um, set of curling matches and the athletes there were in really great shape. They looked like they were working out on a consistent basis. You know, curling can be uh, can be tricky. Those rocks are, are pretty heavy. So, you know, if you're doing that type of athletic resistance training, your performance is going to be better because it's going to make the game or the sport even better. So um, hopefully uh, there's nobody really uh, against it when it comes to resistance training for injury or dangerous or something or growth because there's really no scientific evidence that it, it's showing it what um when can they start when can when can youth start doing resistance training well in uh, 2008 uh, ccep so that's the canadian society of exercise physiology they uh, introduced a position stand confirming that there's no minimum age for um uh youth to be doing resistance training they, they didn't give a guideline for age uh, a couple years later last year they came out with um, a statement saying it's appropriate for children as young as 10 years old uh, to be doing resistance training so and you still do stuff very young uh, and you know there, there's really no issues as long as it's done, being done uh, appropriately and then the question goes to what is resistance training you know um, Body weight exercises are they are body weight exercises are resistance training exercises also you know if you look at uh, weight training or weightlifting uh, whatever kind of terminology you want to use there that is definitely resistance training but body weight exercises because we're using our body as resistance that is also a set of resistance training exercises so push-ups and I'm sure many of us on the webinar today have seen push-ups done incorrectly not done very well at all pull-ups uh very few people can do uh, really good pull-ups dips crunches other calisthenic types of exercises are resistance training exercises so are is doing weights or lifting weights better than doing resistance training exercises and in some cases it actually can be because sometimes uh, in the case of pull-ups or push-ups or dips those exercises are quite difficult to do with our body weight and this is one of the arguments i make for parents that are coming in to see me and they're still concerned about their um their young athlete their young student doing resistance training or lifting weights uh, they're, they're concerned so i talk about push-ups specifically and uh, I, I bring up this slide it's a messy slide there's a lot of information on it but to to kind of sum it up you know there was a, a study published in the journal of strength and conditioning and it was based off push-ups and i want to show what kind of load are people actually lifting when they do an actual push-up so 69% uh, of their body mass in the up position and 74% of their mass in the down position of a traditional push-up. And then they modified the push-up, you know, where you do the pivot point as your knees. And it went to 53 and 61% of the body mass in the um, up and down positions, uh, respectively. So if you're thinking about um, a student, an athlete that weighs, you know, 100 pounds, would you bring them into the weight room and give them, you know, 70 pounds or 75 pounds on the bench press to do a bench press? You know, in many cases, probably not, because that is a lot of weight to do on a bench press for a hundred pound, a hundred pound athlete. You know, maybe not for some, but for many, it, it's going to be a lot. So if they're doing a push up really poorly, you know, we've all seen that where their hips are kind of going up and they're up and down and their arms aren't really bending and they're falling to the ground, really getting up really well. Would it be better to do some dumbbell bench press where you can lighten the load significantly? You know, you can use five pound dumbbells or eight pound dumbbells or 10 pound dumbbells and get them to use those weights to develop the same muscular. You're looking at your pushing muscles, you know, your chest muscles, your front shoulder muscles, your tricep muscles. And then once they get better, you can slowly increase the weight instead of having massive jumps in resistance, you know, going from fives and eights and tens. So in those cases, instead of doing a really poor body weight push up and not really getting a whole lot of out of it and actually putting yourself a little bit more risk for injury you could bring them into the weight room do a dumbbell bench press or a barbell bench press with a whole lot less weight and they're going to get a whole lot more out of that particular exercise they're going to develop more muscular in those pushing muscles than what was originally intended so that's what i always um, mention to 
any parents that are uh, a little concerned about you know the actual lifting weights same same thing goes for you know um a pull up or a chin up many people can't lift their entire body weight doing a pull up or chin up so wouldn't it be better if we went into the gym and we would do that exercise with a lot less weight well that's what a lat pull down is right if you do a lat pull down you know you're sitting in a machine you're pulling a cable to your upper chest and you can again do a lot less weight than your body weight and then slowly build up and gradually build up until you kind of get to your body weight if your goal is to kind of do a pull up or chin up so those are the those are like the arguments that i often make uh Resistance strength has many benefits, and, and we know this uh, for youth uh, as well as adults uh, alike. You know, increased muscular strength, endurance, power, balance, protects joints uh, and muscles from sport injuries. You know, we talked about before about it being dangerous. Well, if we're strengthening up the muscles and tendons and ligaments given around a specific joint, well, that's going to protect that joint from impacts that may occur in the sports that we're playing. So it's actually beneficial to be doing some resistance training weight training to protect those muscles and joints from those potential impacts. Improves motor skills. Fine motor skills are, are great. Um, acute motor skills. Um, look at, uh, you know, the dumbbell bench press that I just mentioned before. You know, if you're using dumbbells and you're trying to clink them together, if you ever taught somebody how to do a dumbbell bench press, oftentimes they uh, don't necessarily have the coordination to kind of get the dumbbells to touch or kind of all over the place. Uh, but eventually, once they keep doing it, they're going to improve their motor skills and kind of get really good at it. So this is a great way to help improve motor skills. Improve performance in nearly all sports. Like I mentioned before, all athletes are doing some sort of uh, weight training uh, nowadays uh, to, to make them better, more powerful, more athletic. Stronger bones. The loading that we're doing in the, in the weight room is uh, helping them lay down um, uh, more bone mass so you get stronger, stronger bones, again, which is protective from sports injuries. Improve self-confidence and self-esteem. You know, many of the greats got into resistance training um, to help improve confidence. You know, if you're if you feel strong and um, you know, even if it's uh, um, aesthetics, yeah, you're, you're looking good. You're going to have more self-confidence, more self-esteem as you kind of go through uh, go through the rest of your life. Health benefits, uh, and you know, that's general health benefits, uh, helping maintain a, um, a healthy body weight, um, helping control blood pressure, cholesterol levels, all those things, all those health benefits can come from, from resistance training or, or weight training. So. Our CSEP, our Canadian Society of Exercise Physiology Guidelines for Youth, you know, we want to engage in a proper warm up, uh, engage in a proper cool down, uh, appropriate exercise and sized equipment. Uh, sized equipment is a really important thing to, to be considering here. Most equipment is designed for an average size person. You know, there's seat adjustments, up and down, chest adjustments, forwards or backwards, you know, handles of adjustments, that type of thing. They don't fit um, people outside that kind of average, um, that average size. So if you have, you know, I, I work with adults that are, uh, that are bigger, taller, wider, you know, broader shoulders, they might not fit in equipment very well. Uh, same with if you're working with um, youth that are um, smaller in size, they might not fit in the equipment very well. So it might put some undue stress on particular joints. So making sure the equipment is the appropriate size for it, depending on uh, what your setup is for resistance training. Low to moderate intensity, uh, and then working out uh, two to three times a week on uh, alternate days. Our guidelines continued uh, to start one to two sets, eight to 15 repetitions, and progressing to four sets, eight to 15 repetitions, eight to 12 exercises. When working with any population, I always love to give a rep range, right? And it doesn't have to be eight to 15 repetitions. You can shorten that range depending on what your particular goals are in, in, the, in, the, um, uh, in the setting. You know, I might say, you know, eight to 10 reps today or eight to 12 reps or 10 to 15 reps or 10 to 12 reps. It gives them a little bit of a, a wiggle room to challenge themselves a little bit more. So for example, if your goal is, you know, eight to 12 repetitions that day, and you're doing a particular exercise, you know, bicep curls or something like that, and you're using, you know, your 15 pound weights and you get up to those 12 repetitions and that's getting easy. Well, okay, now we can, you know, increase the weight up to, you know, maybe, you know, uh, 17 pounds, 18 pounds, 20 pounds, but you might not be able to get the whole 12 repetitions. Well, now you can drop the repetitions back down to eight and your goal over the next couple of weeks is to progressively try to add some more repetitions in there until you get up to 12 for that particular weight. When that becomes easy, you can drop the reps back down again. 
and uh, increase the weight. So you're always trying to uh, chase another wrap, chase another kind of uh, increase in poundage. So that's the whole idea of the pyramiding. Instead of saying you need to get 10 reps, uh, because if they try a new weight, they increase their weight and they can't get those 10 reps, then um, that can be uh, a little disheartening, right? And we want to help develop that self-efficacy. And if we set those goals so that they're able to achieve them, that'll help build that self-confidence, that self-efficacy going forward. Right? So um, lots of wiggle room, lots of play room here when it comes to prescribing sets and reps and exercises. Picking exercises. So what are we looking for when we're picking exercises? You know, we're going to pick some push exercises that help develop our push muscles, chest, front shoulders, triceps. Those are our bench presses, our shoulder presses, um, tricep push downs, that type of thing. Pulling, uh, working our back muscular, bicep muscular, pulling muscles, uh, lap pull downs, rows, bicep curls, that type of stuff. Squatting variations, and there's tons of them. We'll go over a few here in a little bit. Lunging variations, hinging variations. Those are our deadlifts and our our good mornings, that type of stuff. We'll go over in a bit. Rotation. There's always some sort of rotation in any type of uh, sport. You know, baseball swings, hockey swings, golf swings. So adding some sort of rotation in there is um, great. And those are like your wood choppers and stuff. Uh, jumping and landing. So a little bit of plyometrics in there it helps develop a lot of power. And I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit. Um, core stability, both movement and anti-movement exercises. So if you think about a crunch. That'd be a movement exercise for your core and any movement exercise would be a plank where you're just creating an isometric hole right um you know then you have you know bicycle crunches for your sides then side planks or you have something like a wood chopper which is a rotational exercise and then like a paloff press which is an anti-rotation exercise uh, as well and then balance a uh, balance is something that you can do separately uh when i do work with a lot of uh students uh and my athletes who are students I'll throw balance in as a completely separate thing. I might just get the stand on the balance board, or I might incorporate it into one of the circuits where they're doing an exercise like bicep curls while standing on a BOSU or something like that. So you can do those things uh, if you want to incorporate some balance training. And there's all kinds of stuff that we can kind of do. Uh, cost benefit of exercise. There's really no bad exercises out there. Some may be more appropriate than others. Some do have a little bit more risk. Um, and there's always another exercise. There's always another exercise to do out there. You know, I, I teach people to become certified personal trainers. And in one of the exercises we do, we try to name all, all the bicep exercises you can do, right? But that simple, you know, uh, arm flexion exercise. And we've named over 30 different variations of a bicep curl, right? There's that many uh, for a very simple exercise. And then likes and dislikes. So again, if somebody doesn't really like an exercise, because maybe it doesn't feel right. You know, and and that's very that's very possible, right? Uh, there's some certain exercises I personally don't use in my uh, program when I'm working out myself because I just don't like the exercise. I don't like how it feels. Um, is there another exercise that I can do for that? Absolutely, right? There's another dozen exercises that will work the same musculature. Uh, so uh, forcing people to do stuff they don't really like to do, not necessarily encouraging, but if you find something that's going to work the same thing and it's uh, going to be beneficial, then we can we can change that around. Um, when it comes to a cost benefit of exercise, my always go to is kind of a lap pull down. I always tell my lap pull down story. Love lap pull downs, they're a great exercise. If you're familiar with it, you know, pulling that lap pull down bar to that kind of uh, upper collarbone. If you remember years ago, we used to do lap pull downs behind the head, right? We used to pull the bar down behind our neck, uh, touch the rear shoulders. Don't particularly like that exercise. The reasons I don't like it is when you pull it down behind your head, you have to jut your head forward so you get into this forward head position, right? And that's upper cross syndrome. And we're, we're in that a lot already. And we're on our computers all the time, we're on our phones, whatever it is. So I don't wanna exacerbate that head forward positioning and then upper cross syndrome, right? I want that kind of head back, that nice tall posture. So I don't wanna exacerbate that. Pulling that panel behind your, your neck, there's a chance you can hit your C7, C6 vertebrae. You know, that's not a good thing. So there's a little bit more risk involved there. It also puts your rotator cuff in a really poor position because most people can't externally rotate their uh, their arm behind their head like that so it gets your rotator cuff a little funky and re really it's not a functional exercise if you want to throw the term functional around which uh, we tend to do uh, a lot nowadays in, in my setting think about if you're trying to do a pull-up well we never really do pull-ups with our neck to the bar and if we're training for um, everyday life you know if you're thinking about hoisting things you know pulling engines out of cars on pulley systems tackle and pulley systems we never really do that behind our head. We always do that in front of our body, right? So again, the lap pulling that we're doing in front is going to be a little more functional in everyday life. And you can make those arguments for dozens of different exercises, like the shoulder press behind the head and 
and uh, various other uh, exercises and, and equipments in there. So all kinds of stuff that's uh, that's happening. So um, tips and tricks. Some of the things I like to go over quickly. Squats. Finding your squat stance. I'm going to go over that here in a second. Uh, squats and lunges are not hinge movements. Hinge movements are not squat movements. They are different movements, and I'll, I'll touch on those here in a second. We're going to talk about shoulder retraction when doing some rowing exercises. Uh, that's something I see done wrong um, quite a lot. And then hinging at the hips and not necessarily the spine, and I'll show you some of those pictures here in a sec. Um, again, another messy slide here. But uh, uh, one of the reasons why everybody should squat differently is because we're not all the same anatomically, right? Our, our anatomy is different, and we don't really look like that anatomy book. We're not necessarily symmetrical like that. One of the big things I always point out to people is if you look down at our femur anatomy um, down here in the bottom, this is our femur and the head of our femur that goes into our, our hip socket. People have different um, heads of their femur. They're going off at different angles from our femur into our hip socket. So you're not going to know this unless you get an x-ray done. But depending on your anatomy, if you have a, um, uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a hip socket or a femur that's not favorable to deep squats, then you might not be able to do deep squats. Same with your hip bones. If you have a really deep socket in your hip bone and you have a weird angle of your femur, well, when you do a squat, you might get bone on bone action where you're, the head of your femur is jamming into your hip socket and you just can't go any lower. It, you know, uh, All the stretching in the world is not gonna make that any better. Um, it typically, it's, um, uh, it's genetic. You see uh, certain um, uh, ethnic cultures that are really good at deep squatting. They usually dominate in the uh, Olympic weightlifting in the Olympics. Uh, and they usually have a lot of instances of hip dysplasia. So they have really sh shallow hip sockets so they can get really deep and low into a squat. So everybody's a little bit different. So everybody should find their own squat pattern. Saying you need to squat your feet, you know, hip width apart, toes pointed forward is not going to be not going to be great because some people can't do that. Um, and there's uh, no reason why everybody should uh, should do that. I, I give you an example here. This is a picture of me doing some uh, gobble squats on my deck. You can see my... Um, uh, uh, feet about hip width apart, so my kind of shoulders, knees, and toes are kind of all in alignment. You can even see, you know, this foot down here. This is trying to externally rotate. You know, my foot's trying to pull outward. I'm having a hard time kind of pulling in and keeping it forward. And then you can see side view of that squat. You know, I'm I'm not getting really low. I I physically can't get any lower than this. And and my femur it's going on an angle like this, so I'm not getting a parallel. And I got a pretty good forward lean here too. Uh, so there's a, there's a big difference here on my squatting. Now, if I go wide on my squats, you can see I really push my 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 hips all, feet a lot wider than my shoulders, right? So there's my shoulders. So hips are feet are a lot wider. Both feet are externally rotated, so toes are pointing outward. And I got a lot deeper in that squat. And if you look from the side position, you know my femur. It's actually below parallel, so I got a little bit low parallel, and I'm a lot more upright uh, in a stance. I'll flip back and forth there, so you can see there, from there, right? Just from changing where I squat at, um, it makes a huge difference in, in the depth of my squat. So if I had a coach who told me I need to squat like that, well, I'm probably going to hurt my back, and I'm not going to get the most benefit from from those typical squats. So everybody needs to find their own squat stance when 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 squatting. That's one of the things I work with a lot of students is being able to find that find that squat stance. Uh, rowing and shoulder retraction. You know, I really wish we were in in the gym setting to to um, do some of these exercises in the fitness center, but you know, uh, this is kind of the best we can kind of do. You can see here in this picture how far my elbow is back. In this exercise, I'm really focused on just getting the weight into the body as far back as I can possibly get it. Okay, and um, if you notice uh, my elbow back, but you know, if my, my humerus is going along this line, my shoulder, uh, my humerus is kind of jammed right into the front of my shoulder uh, right here. That's called anterior humeral glide. Um, so my shoulders aren't getting back. My shoulders are actually getting pushed forward into the socket. Compared to this side, where my elbows are close to my body. Uh, they're in uh, kind of in alignment with my back there. And my shoulder is pulled backwards. So here, this is where I'm trying to retract my shoulder blades. In this particular exercise, any rowing, whether it's a standing row like this with a with a with a tubing, 
whether it's um, you know seated cable row, whatever. The whole idea is to kind of retract those shoulder blades. So pulling those shoulder blades together, the rhomboids, the muscles that we're trying to work here, connect your spine to your uh, shoulder blades, and we're trying to pull those backwards. We're trying to retract those uh, together. So uh, doing this first one, you're going to get a little bit, of, you might get some cranky shoulders out of this, and you're not really developing that musculature because we're really just focusing on pulling the, pulling the weight back, not necessarily feeling the exercise. You know, uh, when I cue my, 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 my clients, I often put my, my fingers uh, tips in between their shoulder blades and get them to squeeze it together. And that kind of, can kind of, kind of, kind of cue uh, works well for a lot of people. And then hinging, uh, another one where uh, people uh, often have trouble. Um, you know, I, I have my, my dowling here, my little broom handle. Uh, I get a pretty good straight alignment here. And you see my knees are soft when I'm doing it. I'm hinged over, so this would be a good position to do, you know, like a barbell row, um, you know, maybe doing rock pulls, or I'm starting off doing a deadlift, and I'm just checking out form here. Uh, this one, you can see I'm starting in the curve, especially my lower back. My knees are locked, um, uh, and uh, it's not a real good position to be in. You can get some compromised lower, lower back from this. Uh, one of the cues that I often use with a lot of my, um, my clients is to use that same doweling and set them up in that standing tall position. So when you're doing this, the, the dowling should touch the back of your head, right in between your shoulder blades and all the way down to your hips. And then you should be able to hinge over, keeping your knees soft so that it's still touching the back of your head in between your shoulder blades and down to your hips in this position. Uh, if you're in the position and it's not touching those places, then you know your back's not flat uh, and uh, you can kind of get some compromised back. So that's one of the things that uh, when I'm starting out with, uh, with youth, with athletes, I'm just working on getting those mechanics down correctly. Uh, so uh, a great little tip there, uh, a dowling um, broom handles work great to, to, to um, help with those kinesthetic cues. Warm up, uh, typical, we go into our general warm up again, you know, five to 10 minutes uh, of workout time. You know, this is where you're going to do, you know, a little jog, you jump on the bikes, you know, that, that type of thing. Elevate the heart rate a little bit, get the body physically warm, get some of that snowmobile joint fluid uh, into the joints, um, get them warmed up and cushioned. Then get into specific warm up. This is when you get into the actual exercise itself. Uh, this mimics a resistance exercise, uh, increases neuromuscular efficiency. We recommend 50% of one RM for 10 to 15 repetitions. And again, you can do um, anything like that. Think about your typical bench press. If you're going into the gym and you're gonna bench press 200 pounds, you're not gonna go into the gym and throw 200 pounds on the bar and just start benching it, right? You're gonna start off with the bar, just kind of feel the exercise out, feel the movement pattern, make sure you get that, kind of get the movement pattern down well. And then you're gonna load a little bit of weight on it, do a couple reps, go a little, little bit more weight and do a couple reps until you get to your 200 pounds of your working sets and going from there. So. Um, with youth, same thing, you know, if we're going to do bench press or something like that, they're going to do the actual movement again with a very light load to make sure that they're uh, warming up that movement pattern. And then we kind of load it up uh, to their working load for their working sets. Uh, for a lot of my athletes, I will do um, a dynamic warm up as well. So you got to get your general warm up. They're going to come in, jump on the bikes, do whatever. But I will get them to do a dynamic warm up, just like in many of our. Um, sports classes, um, you know, you're going to do some A runs, some A skips, some B kicks, some karaoke, um, side shuffles, leg swings, Frankenstein walks, knees to chest, whatever it is that you would do. Um, many athletes, um, if your students are athletes, they have their own kind of set warm up because, you know, their soccer coach, basketball coach will get them to do many of these things already. Uh, and that's great. Um, uh, it, it brings out a lot of good movement patterns, gets a lot of those hips worked out. A uh, shoulders warmed up, um, and it's great. And you could just throw it into your general warm up before you get into the, the actual uh, specific warm up. Set preference. Now, this is what you're going to do in the weight room. Are you going to do straight sets? Uh, that's our typical. You know, you do your uh, 10 reps, and then you rest a minute or two, and then you do another 10 reps, and you do rest uh, a minute or two, another 10 reps, that type of thing. Right, so there's rest in between uh, sets, you're staying with the same exercise. Supersets, that's where you're jumping back and forth, typically two opposing muscles. So thinking about doing bicep curls and tricep pushdowns, right? You do a set of one, then you do a set of another one. Uh, if there's resting, you can take the rest after that superset and do that again. Um, uh, great if you can use the same piece of equipment because it, uh, it helps um, uh, 
keep people kind of in one central area and it doesn't tie up as much equipment um, all over the gym. Tri sets, again, three exercises back to back to back, giant sets, four or more, and then circuits. Um, my preference when I work with a lot of students or my athletes is to uh, do uh, circuits. And I'm going to jump into a little bit more about that because it has some benefits and some other things that we can kind of do uh, in the circuits. Like adding in other aspects of uh, fitness. So you can add in some, some uh, cardio, you can send anaerobic um, um, cardiovascular stuff, you can add in some agility, you can add in some balance training, you can add in some sports specific stuff as well, right? <clears throat> it's easy to set up multiple stations um, or set up multiple exercises with the same equipment. You know, if you have um, uh, minimal equipment and you're just sitting around, you're gonna use, uh, everybody's gonna have a set of dumbbells, well, you're gonna do all the same exercise with a set of dumbbells, right? Or maybe the you know, class is being divvied up into you can have um, upper body and lower body. So you get one circuit of upper body, one circuit of lower body. Well, they're going to do those five to six exercises, and then when they're done, they're going to switch. So this is great to kind of help um, uh, maximize space within uh, the, the fitness center. So uh, notes on circuits, reps, eight to 15 reps, um, one to four sets, same as the... Uh, guidelines for from CSEP tempo, uh, control for modus exercises. Um, tempo is typically written as a three or four letter or number um, uh, program, uh, 2020. That means uh, two seconds on the negative, zero pause, two seconds on the positive, and zero pause. So it's it's under control, right? Um, certain exercises, if you're doing like box jumps and stuff like that, you it's hard to, you you, you can't put a tempo in there because it's, it's explosive, right? So if you're doing bicep curls, you make sure it's nice and slow and controlled. Bench press is nice and slow and controlled. They're not bouncing it, that type of thing. Add in, like I said, the cardio, the balance, the agility, coordination drills. Toss in sports specific uh, skills, basketball, hockey, soccer. You know, um, in the, the facility I work in, a PEI, uh, in the summertime, we'll often set up a, an indoor um, uh, swing cage. We have some synthetic ice. We'll put them some synthetic ice. Uh, my hockey guys will take their hockey sticks in, and in one of the circuits, I might throw in, you know, they have to do X number of wrist shots uh, to our into the net, or X number of backhands, or put a little, you know, um, some cones they have to kind of go around with their with the pucks or or whatever. So it's it's, it's good to kind of toss in, and it's easy to toss in some of those things, depending on where you're doing uh, your uh, weight training or resistance training at, right? Depending on the um, the facility you have. Circuits will depend on, again, the equipment, the variety type, as well as the space, the size, and the makeup, right? You have the space to do um, agility drills. Um, uh, do you have, you know, um, are you doing it in the gymnasium? So maybe you have minimal equipment, but you have lots of movement space. Even what the walls of your facility are made of, you know, in the facility I work at, uh, here in PEI, our walls are made out of bricks, so I can actually throw medicine balls at the walls. So that adds another um, couple dozen exercises that I can use because now I can throw medicine balls around the place, right? In many facilities, you can't because it's, you know, um, uh, you know, a drywall or wood walls, and that's going to damage the walls. So it depends on the spies, uh, size and makeup of your, of your facility where you're doing stuff. Progressions, regressions, it's a good idea to have a bunch of these. Um, on hand for doing particular exercises because if a student can't do it um how can you regress them to something a little bit easier or if they're excelling at it how are you going to make it a little bit more challenging for them if they're not finding it challenging so some of the examples i kind of put in here push-ups from the knees high plank hold negative push-ups push-ups from your toes plank again from the knees from the toes maybe you're taking one foot or one arm off in a plank position um, squats, you can do bench squats, you can do body weight squats, you can do goblet, goblet squats, um, barbell squats, front squats, overhead squats, you know, jump squats, all kinds of variations there. Lunges are again into stationary lunges, dynamic walking lunges, reverse lunges, pendulum lunges. Again, there's tons of different varieties and variations there. So if somebody doesn't necessarily like walking lunges, maybe they like, you know, um, just dynamic lunges or reverse lunges. There's all kinds of different variations that you can kind of do when you're um, working on your progressions, your regressions for your particular um, your particular uh, program. Polling question number two. So, okay, if you're kicking around, we launched that poll so we can kind of see what type of equipment people are using. There we go.
So Rob, uh, while we're waiting for the poll result, uh, we did receive some good questions. Oh, so uh, maybe we can take the time to answer some of these. Sure, um, let's, so take, let's we, take the time to answer a couple questions. Perfect. So we got one question from Jess. Um, and the question is, when choosing exercises, do you say, would you say an individual's anatomical differences and goals will be the two main considerations? Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, depending on when picking any exercise, you know, having a specific goal in mind is is a must, right? So if um, students are training for, you know, a particular athletic sport, then absolutely you're going to want to cater some of those exercises to that to that particular sport to get them get them uh, ready for that, you know. Um, and then yeah, the the anatomical differences uh, definitely, you know, when when choosing exercises. Some people can't do particular exercises um, because of whether it's anatomical differences or they're having issues with movement uh, patterns. So regressing exercise and moving up to something more specific. I do it all the time. Even when I have um, circuits that are available on the board, I'm often modifying for particular particular um, athletes or students that are coming in. I'm like, okay, I know this person's having difficulty um, squatting because they have poor ankle dorsiflexion. So I'm going to give them instead of regular goblet squats and give them bench squats or elevated um, heel bench squats or something like that. So you can modify things as that. But yeah, when choosing it, you know, it depends on what your, your, you know, your fitness center, um, what you're doing in, in that particular class. Um, I've worked with uh, high school students out in Calgary and oftentimes it was <clears throat> specific sports. So, um, you know, the hockey guys will get something different and then, you know, um, then, uh, the, you know, the people that are playing volleyball or the students that were playing, you know, baseball and they're in the off season versus if they're in the in season. So there's different, um, different considerations when taking, right. That's why, you know, in my, uh, everyday life, it's personal training. So we try to personalize it as much as possible. It's really uh, tricky to kind of do general stuff, unless you're looking at just kind of, uh, you're working with a lot of younger students and you're just doing general fitness and getting them used to or accustomed to, uh, the weight room. I hope that answers the question. Okay, perfect, perfect. And it looks like we have 76% of attendees have voted. Mm -hmm. um, and in the chat, we have received some feedback as well saying um, in their school, there are body weight and tension band exercises. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people are saying minimal equipment. Mm -hmm. um, and we have, um, body resistance and portable equipment okay. uh, answered. Okay, so we'll give you another uh, 10 seconds before we close the poll. Okay, great. <clears throat> All right, so we're now closing the poll and let me share the result with everyone. Fantastic. Okay, I'll hand it back to you. Awesome, thanks. So, um, many people, you know, minimal equipment. Um, so I, I, I did put together the, some of these circuits. So these are some examples of of, of uh, exercise that you can kind of do um, minimal equipment. At the end and in the email, you're going to get. I'm going to share my my contact information. Everybody. If anybody wants some more information, wants me to help them kind of develop some stuff they can do with the equipment they have, then great. For most of the circuits I've developed, it is a minimal equipment um, that you would need, some dumbbells, maybe some portable equipment stuff. Um, and there's ways to modify all these exercises kind of going around. So uh, some of the circuits, uh, and, and again, yeah, most people don't have access to uh, full, full weight rooms. Uh, I, when I worked in Calgary, we did take some class, high school classes into some of the commercial fitness centers that were around and it worked out great, but I know most uh, most people don't have that uh, that ability. So some circuits, uh, and there's a legend in there, so because some of my acronyms here, uh, a lot of people don't know, but uh, I'll quickly go through some of these. Um, and again, there's a PDF gonna come out with all this stuff and I'll make sure all my slides are available and the recording of this as well. So goblet squats, barbell bench presses, uh, hammer curls, tricep push downs, cable roll, Blueberry. So that's a great circuit. You know, you can go from one exercise to the next to the next to the next. And when you're doing these circuits, everybody doesn't have to start in the same spot, right? You don't all have to start at goblet squats. You know, students can start at 
the bench press or the hammer curls. And when you do one set of the bench press, then you're going to go onto the hammer curls. Then you're going to go onto the tricep push down. Then you're going to go to the cable row. Then you can do the glute bridge and rest as necessary in between, right? So here we're doing, you know, some lower body, some upper body push, some upper body pull, some lower upper body push, uh, some upper body pull, and some lower body core stability. So it, it's it's a great combination. The muscles that aren't working are resting um, to, to get ready for their, their next set. So resting as necessary in between these. Glute bridge, I think in the video um, that I have in the PDF, the the exercise is being shown as doing repetitions. We're doing glute bridge coming down, up and down. You can also do that as a static hole as well. Step ups, great lower body. Dumbbell incline press, twist curls and the bicep curl exercise with a little supination in there. Dumbbell skull crushers or lying dumbbell extensions. Skull crushers is a, is a kind of slang term that's kind of thrown around the gym. Uh, stability ball hamstring curls so stability ball those big giant exercise balls the swiss balls you can do hamstring curls on those which is great low plank the video attached to that low plank one it shows lots of different plank variations it's great uh, it's a great resource these circuits uh, a bike ride so i threw in a spin bike ride so you know and this one's 80 percent intensity for 90 second uh, bike ride so a little anaerobic bike ride split squat seated overhead press so a shoulder press a uh, pal off press a great anti-rotation exercise, uh, kickbacks for the triceps, uh, hamstring curls that you would need a specific piece of equipment. But again, we can use stability balls and we can use other, other equipment as well. I put a lap in there. Often I'll get my students to run around the building. Um, if you're doing it in the gymnasium, maybe you're going to run around the, do a lap around the gym. Maybe you're going to do it in between sets. You're going to set up circuits, you know, different corners of the gym. There's great ways to do that. Bench squats, great for helping people to get used to squatting if they're knee squatter not sitting back sitting down on two benches sitting back up again is a great way to do it and you can still load it with dumbbells and barbells and stuff um lap pull downs and again variations you know you'd need a machine for this you can set it up with you know tubing and pull, pull pulleys and stuff like that but uh and change the handles depending on what your setup is like incline support row great way to help people get into a rowing position without compromising their back um, so if they're not really good at hinging, they can uh, use the incline support row, get a really good rowing exercise in uh, without compromising their lower back. Um, box jumps, again, a little bit of plyometrics there. Um, and when I do box jumps, it's all about landing good and high, not landing low, uh, and walking out of the box. You know, I'm not jumping up and down on the box. I'm more about a good one power up and then stepping down. I'm not trying to do it for reps or time. I just want to get good, uh, tight, uh, tight jumps in there. High plank, and that's just uh, holding a push-up position. Stairs, again, if you have uh, stairs in your facility, um, if the bleachers are appropriate for doing that stuff, maybe a, a back hallway stairs are appropriate to running stairs, great. Flat dumbbell uh, presses, overhead extensions, uh, lateral lunges, so some side lunges there, some bent over row, medicine ball slams, um, a cautious with medicine ball slams, you know, uh, if you don't have good slam balls, Medicine balls do bounce. Uh, if you're not using the right ball, I don't want it to bounce and, and get uh, uh, somebody in the face. I've seen that happen uh, a couple of times. Um, uh, incline bench press, BOSU crossover drill. So it's a great crossover drill. You can do it on low boxes. You can do it on the floor. You can do it on ladders. Um, split squats, uh, lateral raises over shoulders, ladder drill. And in this video, I put in a whole bunch of different ladder drills. And again, whatever you like, side planks, Skipping, uh, jumping rope, right? Uh, jump, rope jump. Um, regular dynamic lunges, uh, incline dumbbell press, one arm dumbbell rows, medicine ball chest pass. So again, uh, whether you're throwing it at uh, a brick wall, you can do medicine ball chest passes uh, between students if you're doing some partner workouts. Micro hurdle drills, so those little hurdles, you can, you can do some stuff. And again, that video on that one shows a whole bunch of different variations. Unloaded jump squats, front raises, calf raises, wrist curls. 5105 or a pro agility drill uh, and a TRX row if you have a TRX in your facility. So um, those are some examples of some some great um, great exercises that you can do. Some of the ones that I use with my students and most of them call for very minimal equipment, right? You can do um, with uh, even some tubing and some dumbbells uh, would work great. Uh, my suggestions, obviously practice exercise beforehand to make sure you're comfortable with them. Uh, have your progressions or regressions uh, ready, uh, how are you can make it easier, how you can make it harder for particular students, um, and be familiar with spotting techniques. So if you're doing something like uh, dumbbell bench presses or bench presses, uh, squats, how are you spotting them? How do you make sure the students are safe when doing those particular exercises? <clears throat>
cool down, you want to do a cool down when you're done, uh, light cardio, bike, um, light little jog, something like that. Uh, this is when you kind of get into your static stretching. We always recommend static stretching afterwards, not beforehand. Again, doing all your major body parts, um, 20 to 30 seconds per stretch, one to three sets. And you can do some foam rolling here now. Some people like to do foam rolling at the beginning. Some people like to do foam rolling at the end. Some people like to do both. Uh, if you have foam rollers, again, um, if the equipment's there, you don't have to, obviously. Um, just not light stretching works great for cool down. Uh, throw some yoga in there. It it's, uh, can make an, uh, an awesome, awesome day. Things to keep in mind, uh, safety, again, safeties of the utmost when we come to this um, this stuff. So making sure people are safe, uh, you know, without proper supervision, people can get uh, injured, uh, you know, like I mentioned, medicine ball slams or, you know, uh, weights dropping on toes, not being spotted safely, um, picking the appropriate loads. Body awareness, again, how's your body moving in space? Um, and again, uh, what are you doing and what are other people are around you? Um, I've seen many people kind of get bumped into because um, they weren't aware uh, that somebody's walking up behind them and they're doing a lot of razor bicep curl or something like that. People get kind of get bumped. Um, so being aware of your, your body awareness and in your body uh, space. Form, form, form. This is what I always preach. Practicing form, uh, especially at a young age, is a great way to help develop it for, um, uh, for life. When you kind of get that form down, it's, it sticks. Um, I would never start increasing the load or increasing the weight that somebody's using unless their form is is, uh, is immaculate. Right? So uh, there's no sense of loading somebody with poor form because then the, 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 you're just looking for an injury. Full range of motion. Uh, again, you're working the uh, muscle, the muscle belly into a full range of motion. So you want to make sure they're getting a full range of motion on that partial squats or partial bench press because uh, that'll just lead to um, only developing strength in that partial range of motion and not that full range of motion. Uh, go light and do it right. That's the model we have around the gym. Uh, whenever I'm working with any of my students or athletes, I always say go light and do it right. I don't care how much weight anybody can lift. Uh, that's not what we're here for. You know, we're not um, uh, power lifters or we're not Olympic weightlifters. You know, um, if they're if I'm training hockey players or I'm training soccer players, their goal is to kind of get better at those things. You know, um, you want to get a little bit stronger, great, but you're not a Olympic powerlifter, I don't care how much weight you can you can actually lift. So uh, go light and do it right. Machines are fine. So if you do have machines, you have access to that commercial weight room. They're great at helping find the working muscles. If you're like, people are like, oh, where should I feel this? Um, because machines will kind of help isolate specific muscles. They're okay for that. But remember the sizing and setup that I mentioned earlier, they're great for kind of the average size person. So people that are kind of really big or really small. Yeah, even myself, I got that kind of wider shoulders. I don't, some machines just don't feel quite right for me. So i make sure that that setup is, uh, is correct. Okay. Uh, can we start now, you know, in the current situation we're at with uh, COVID-19, uh, can you implement this if you're doing, um, you know, uh, physical education classes with your students online? Well, you can, and actually it depends. Um, many personal trainers are doing personal training online. The link in the um, in the PDF that I'm gonna it's gonna get sent out to everybody. Many of those videos are part of a software program that I use when I do online personal training with my clients. So if you're familiar with the exercises, you're good with coaching the exercises, then there's nothing saying that you can't do this right now. Even if you're kind of getting started, focusing on form, right? You know, we in the fitness industry realize that right now is a really trying time, and most people aren't gonna start putting on tons of muscle or increase a ton of strength. They're going to increase in their conditioning, absolutely, or they're going to really kind of dial down to their form. So if you're looking at working with some students in the future um, or, you know, you're working with a group of students and they're going to get to a next a new level next year, maybe you're just going to start focusing on their squat form and they're finding their correct form for the squat patterns or their hinging patterns. Uh, so you can do that stuff uh, remotely online. You know, we do it right now, whether it's, you know, uh, go to meetings like this, Zoom calls where you can see everybody at the same time, one-on-one, um, -on -one, they're gonna you know, videotape themselves or, or whatever, is a great way to kind of uh, focus on some of those things. Get creative with weights. Again, you know, people, some, uh, many people have a little, you know, dumbbell or tubing around their house, it's great. Uh, some people are using makeshift weights, soup cans, milk jugs, half-filled water, filled water, that type of thing. They can work great. Paint cans, again, filled, not filled. Uh, again, safety first. Uh, tubing or elastic tubing, again, works great, but again, safety first. Is it anchored well? There's all kinds of YouTube videos out there of people, you know, getting 
you know, slapped with uh, tubing uh, because it's not secured properly or it snaps or something like that, right? So again, uh, or people using inappropriate um, pieces of furniture as resistance training furniture. So people lying on uh, coffee tables or patio chairs thinking it's a good place to do bench press, but it can't support the weight. So it ends up collapsing. There's all kinds of videos like that. So again, safety first, being careful or cautious of where people are doing particular exercises or what they're using for uh, resistance training equipment. And then just modifying the exercise to fit you, the situation, right? So uh, it might just be body weight exercise, body weight resistance training exercises, you know, the, the push-ups and modifying the push-ups and, you know, um, uh, core workouts, uh, getting the squat form down, getting the hinging form down, getting the lunging form down. That stuff works great um, and can help benefit people later on once we kind of get back into doing things uh, in person in the classroom. Gymnasium. So if you need more info, if you're interested more about kind of resistance training, there are certifications out there. Nobody uh, has uh, degrees, uh, but if you want more, there's a couple weekend courses out there that people kind of take. Uh, Camp4 Pro is a great one. I contract for Camp4 Pro. Uh, we teach people to become certified personal trainers. It's a couple weekend course. It's a great way to do it. Uh, many provinces have their own provincial fitness unit like Alberta, uh, Fitness of Brunswick, Nova Scotia, uh, BC, Yukon, Saskatchewan, Ontario, Manitoba. Quebec doesn't have necessarily a provincial fitness unit. They have um, a couple of local ones, uh, a couple of ones that are created by uh, independent gyms, uh, and even the YMCA. Local YMCA's have certifications to be um, uh, personal trainers. They have their um, individual conditioning level one, two, and three certification that people uh, can take as well that are out there. So if you want to take a couple weekend course, a little bit learn a little bit more about resistance training. Um, uh, these courses uh, work great. And if anybody's looking for more information, I'm more than happy to kind of share that with you uh, uh, later on. Uh, but I guess now, if we have any time left, we can take some more questions. And while we're doing questions, I will pop my email address up here. Uh, it will go in the email that you guys are gonna get uh, after this uh, with the recording and the PDF file. So I'll send that stuff all off to you. Um, or fail, send it off to you uh, in the next uh, what, 24 to 48 hours. Um, but uh, if people do want to contact me, uh, Rob Dixon, robjdixon at gmail.com, more than happy to kind of help you out um, and then answer specific questions if we kind of don't get to it, uh, to get to it here. Uh, Faye, anything, um, any questions kind of popped up that people want me to uh, touch on? Yeah, so uh, thank you again, Rob. Um, and we are now going to begin answering some of the questions submitted during today's presentation. Uh, in fact, we've received many good questions and we'll try to answer a couple of them. Um, and the first question um, is coming from David. Uh, and the question is, could you summarize a quick do's and don'ts with students accessing online workouts? So they were doing this before, but even more now with COVID-19. So how to know a trainer is actually certified or the online workshop is safe? Oh, um, so that, that's a great question, David. Um, uh, unfortunately, the fitness industry and online personal training is, is not regulated, right? So um, there are certifications out there, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're, um, um, they're, they're great. Anybody can create their own certification. You know, there's a list of, if they're, you know, if they do have kin degrees, if they're, you know, certified through uh, CSEP, if they're th certified through um, CPTN as Canada Personal Training Network, Canfa Pro, any of the provincial fitness units, uh, that's a great uh, start to see if those trainers are, are certified. And the other thing that I would be uh, uh, curious about is if the trainer has insurance and is it valid for them to be training online? That was one of the big things that we got into in the fitness industry here. So I'm insured to do personal training online through my insurance company. They cover me. Um, so if it's a good personal trainer, they're going to make sure that they have insurance through their insurance company, their personal liability insurance that's covering them to conduct online classes or online personal training. If they're not covered, then they might just be somebody that's taken their business online and they just want to kind of give it a whirl, right? So you can ask for their credentials. You can ask for their, their certifications. You can make sure that they're up to date because even if you get a, you know, uh, a certification, it might not be up to date. It might have expired a while ago. 
Uh, and then if they do have insurance, be conducting uh, online personal training. So those are the things that I would be kind of uh, cautious about when um, picking an online an online trainer. And then cool. if they're yeah. asking, okay. if you're doing online training, I guess the other question would be, are they making their uh, clients fill out any type of uh, form, right? Are they just doing general exercise classes where there's <clears throat> doing yoga or fitness class and everybody's just joining in like a DVD video, or are they actually doing like uh, specific personalized stuff telling you um, questions, uh, telling you exercises to do specifically um, and modifying those exercises, right? So is it that actual one-on-one -on -one personal training where they're making it personal to you and are they asking you questions, are they getting you to fill out forms, health questionnaires, backgrounds, profiles, are they monitoring your form via Zoom or Skype or whatever? Uh, those are the things that I'd be kind of worried about or, or cautious about when uh, when doing that online stuff with um, if it's an external trainer doing stuff uh, with students. Hopefully that answered answered your question. Yeah. Um, and the next question is from uh, Nicole, and the question is: When working with students with a wide variety of needs and abilities, how would you recommend setting up the class? Hmm. Uh, a great question, and again, I, I do that as well. I typically take uh, I, I typically create um, several different uh, circuits, right? So I'll take a, a circuit of I would say uh, really kind of regress exercise, um, ones that are fairly simple to do, um, and then I have some kind of uh, medium uh, complicated exercises and some more advanced exercises. And then if you have your students that you know um, you know need a little bit less supervision and they're doing a little bit more of the advanced stuff because they have some more you know, experience in, in the weight room, kind of set them up and let them kind of go on their on their own, um, setting up the the students of that kind of uh, middle of the row stuff. And then the uh, ones that are a little bit newer to resistance training might need a little bit more guidance and then setting them off. So typically what I would do, you know, if I have a classroom and I have my stuff set up, I know the, the students that I, I need to spend less time with, they're going to go off on their own. I'm still keeping an eye on them, so I'm monitoring everybody at the exact same time. But um, I'm setting up one student. You know, if it's a brand new student, you know, I'll set them up on one particular exercise. Maybe pair them up with somebody that might be a little bit more familiar with stuff in the class, so there's that cross learning between students. And getting them to do one exercise at a time. You know, get them doing their uh, incline dumbbell bench press. They're, you know, you get them their form set up. I'm like, okay, cool. Do ten more reps of that while you're going over to the kind of next student, right? Usually if you're doing one of those circuits, you know, it, depending on the length of, you, you know, if you've got an hour with, with the students, once you get through all the exercises, you know, if you're doing the, the five or six exercises in a row, then you're going to repeat those exercises. So once you get through all of them, then that's, that's great. And you can take that circuit and you can build off it, right? So if you have your regress circuit of the exercise you can do, and then, you know, two or three days later, they're going to come back and you're going to do resistance training again. Well, if they're familiar with, you know, those six exercises, Take five of them. That's where you're going to start off with, and you change one of the exercises out to make a to put a different exercise in there. So they're learning a new exercise. So starting off with the base, and then progressively adding newer exercises. So they're developing their movement patterns, and you can check their form and continue on. And um, um, same thing with the with the older um, uh, uh, students that might have a little more familiarity with the weight room. They have their complicated circuits. You have your base exercise that they know, and they're going to add a new exercise in. Do it as a group potentially. You know, okay, here's a new exercise. Show, explain it. Then they're off to the to the to the races, and you're kind of coaching in the background. You're you know, cueing, correcting, coaching, walking around, making sure everybody's doing everything uh, everything correctly. That's how I would do it, and that's how I typically do it with my uh, uh, with my coaching sessions with my athletes, my younger athletes. Great question. Okay, next question is from uh, Jessica, and she's asking, how would you encourage students or athletes who are not interested in resistance training, but enjoy uh, sports in general? Um, you know, it, that comes down to the, to the likes and dislikes. Um, I, I would su suggest them and, and, and mention them or something that, you know, they will, you know, if they're, if they're interested in athletics, then um, telling them it's, it's going to make them a better athlete overall and then kind of ask them what their objections to the resistance training you know uh, are you know do they not like the feel of the weights uh are they just not familiar with the exercises um what their objections are specifically and try to um kind of uh, mitigate those or, or try to problem solve around those and then you know getting them to um 
pick some of the exercises. You know, if you take anybody, and even when I work with personal training clients who are sent to me, you know, kind of against their will by doctors, I'll get them to pick exercises that they enjoy. You know, doing nothing is not going to get any results. Doing something is doing better than doing nothing, even if it's something that you may not have prescribed. Oh, you just want to do, you know, uh, you know, if it's a, the, the typical, I want to do bench press and bicep curls. Okay, cool. Let's do bench press and bicep curls, right? Then they feel, okay, good. This is good. I like doing this. I'm going to continue this. And then we can kind of work on encouraging them to try a new exercise here, a new exercise there, right? And uh, building off of those kind of positive behaviors instead of saying, okay, we're going to start doing this exercise and they might not like it, you know, then they, you know, they kind of get that nasty feel for it. But if they do enjoy doing particular exercises, encouraging that, working on that, tell me if they're involved with athletics, it's going to make them feel um, uh, better and perform better. And then dealing with their specific objections to, uh, to the resistance training and try to uh, get rid of any of those myths or um, um, uh, objections that they might have. Okay. Nice. Nice. Um, so a lot of people are asking about where or um, how can you find a resource about certain activities. So uh, Carolina is asking about uh, a resource for stretch with uh, foam mm -hmm. roll. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so what's your take on that? So all kinds of resources, you know, if you're looking for <clears throat> You know, something a little bit more in depth. If you're familiar with the uh, Human Kinetics uh, website, um, www.humankinetics.com, uh, this is where they have all those kind of physical education books. Um, if you go in there and you search foam rolling, there'll be um, books that come up if you want to do that. Um, and those are, are all accredited type of uh, books for stretching, foam rolling, that type of stuff. Uh, great resources there. You can seek out uh, professionals within your uh, given area. They might be um, some physios or some kinesiologists that do particular workshops around your given area. Um, YouTube's okay, but again, anybody can put anything on YouTube, so you might not kind of get the best resource. Typically, I go to Human Kinex first. No affiliation with those guys, but I just love buying their books. Um, and they even have online courses as well. Um, some of them would be a little bit more expensive, but you can kind of get some, some really great resources there. Um, if you're looking for something specific around your area, some contacts, feel free to fire me off an email. I'm more than happy to kind of uh, help you kind of dive into some resources. Or if you find something and you want to kind of vet it a little bit more, uh, I'm more than happy to kind of give you my opinion if it's if it's a, a credible resource or not. Um, again, you can fire me off an email. I'm more than happy to kind of help you through that. So that's typically where I find a lot of my resources. Um, if if you if you go through um, um, fitness centers uh, like gyms, like actual commercial gyms around. Um, their personal trainers that are working at those gyms often should be and need to be taking continuing education. Uh, so they need to continually do stuff just like many uh, professions do. So those trainers there might have um, resources. Some gyms, commercial gyms, will bring in specialists to work with their trainers. And I often encourage, you know, physical education teachers to go in and um, take some of those courses as well, right? If you want to expand your knowledge on, you know, uh, foam rolling or stretching or Pilates or yoga to help incorporate it into some of your, your classes, taking some of those continuing education, whether it's a couple hours or a day or so um, for that continuing education is great. So maybe starting off with maybe your commercial uh, fitness centers, see if they're offering any for um, personal trainers that you might be able to kind of get in on. And um, I thank you for, for offering, um, you know, like the opportunity for attendees to contact you directly. I think that's a really nice offer. Thank you for doing that. Um, yeah. And uh, let's go to our last question. I think it's also come from uh, multiple attendees. Um, yeah. And the question is, um, how would you know that an exercise is right for uh, a youth or like a, a teenager? Uh, for example, TRX or... Um, Paleometric exercise. So, mm -hmm. when would be the right time to start, or how can educators to instruct teenagers to start those, and at what time? Uh, that's a great, great question. You know, when it comes to something like the TRX, um, <clears throat> uh, TRX, a certain exercise. If you're familiar with the TRX and you're comfortable using it. You can use the TRX, even just uh, beginning with like a TRX row. I have a lot of my, you know, eight, 10-year-olds using a TRX row. 
and that's they they find it uh, um, fine, right? You know, if you get the right angle and they're only lifting a small percentage of the body weight, it, it works out great, and it's something they can they can expand on because they're familiar with the piece of equipment and they can kind of build off it, right? Um, you know, if they're able to to perform whatever movement pattern you're kind of looking to do um, without um, uh, without any issues with body weight wise or on another piece of equipment. So if you're doing like a, a standing cable row or a, a row on a cable machine or something like that, and they're not really having any issues, introducing to the TRX in a short way is, is easy, right? And if they're, you know, um, you're going to uh, regress the exercise so it makes it easy for them, and then progressing as it, it makes it a little more difficult. Certain TRX exercises might not be appropriate because, you know, like uh, a TRX, um, you know, a push-up or bench press or fly, because they can't do regular push-ups uh, yet. So they don't have the shoulder stability. So uh, that will be a progression to a regular push-up. So I wouldn't necessarily put uh, a younger athlete on something like that. But, you know, uh, a TRX can be used even for, you know, squatting, right? Maybe they need uh, a little bit of counterbalance when they're squatting to help them help them up. So we're gonna use that as a regression of an exercise. So it, it all depends on the individual. And um, again, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, uh, case by case type of basis, right? Uh, some some uh, youth uh, athlete students, I wouldn't uh, do the kind of higher complicated ones on, but other ones, you know, uh, um, the the younger athletes, I would do a lot of the easier ones on. Plyometrics, plyometrics, is, uh, you know, used to be called jump training years ago, <clears throat> and athletes jump, right? You know, uh, basketball players they jump. You know, it doesn't matter, you know, what uh, you know, in age they are, they're doing some sort of jumping. Now, if you're talking about like, you know, box jumps, you know, I have my, you know, 10 year olds doing box jumps, you know, now they're not doing what we call a depth jump, where a depth jump is where you're standing on a box, you're dropping down, loading, and then springing up again. Those typically you would have to um, have a fairly good squat, typically a body weight squat to start doing some of those, um, those types of uh, movements. But, you know, hurdle stuff, you know, ladder drills, you know, you know Kids, kids jump all the time. So doing it in a safe way um, is, um, is definitely doable. Um, there's a lot more resources out there. Again, there's, there's books on Human Connects about plyometric training and some guidelines on when to start introducing certain, certain aspects. But even just starting off with some ladder drills, hurdle drills, micro hurdle drills, a little bit of jumping that they would do in their sport anyway um, is a great way to kind of help with that. And then you can work on technique, right? So you know, if they're, you're concerned about their landing um, because they're landing with, you know, knees locked and you can just feel the jarring going right through their body, getting to land and just jump with soft knees, landing appropriately, jumping off and taking off appropriately, working on those form and that kinesthetic awareness, they don't really need to jump high. Um, they just need to jump well and land well. So you can, doesn't have to have, have to be a big movement, but you can kind of scale it down to the appropriate, um, um, uh, the appropriate clientele, the appropriate students that you're working with. Hopefully that answers it. If you're looking for, you know, if anybody, if I, uh, these questions that I've uh, answered here, if somebody's looking for a little bit more in-depth, I didn't quite get to your uh, answer. Um, you're looking for something more, more than happy to kind of have that uh, offline conversation with you. Perfect. Um, thank you so much, Rob, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. If you do have any other questions, please feel free to contact Rob or uh, us at conference at phecanada.ca. And once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar and also the handouts. Uh, on behalf of PHE Canada or presenters and partners, Human Kinetics and Canada's National Ballet School, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thanks again, Rob. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye.